Yeah, welcome everybody to uh, the invited lecture. It's a great pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Nick Trefessen from the University of Oxford. So let me quickly introduce him. Nick, Nick is a professor of numerical analysis and head of the numerical analysis group at Oxford University. He was educated at Harvard and Stanford and held positions at New York University, MIT and Cornell before moving to Oxford in 1997. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, a member of the US National Academy of Engineering, and he was president of SIAM from 2011 to 2012. He has won many prizes, including the gold medal of the Institute of Mathematics and its application, the Naylor Prize of the LMS, and the Polia Prize for Mathematical Exposition, and the John von Neumann Prize from SIAM. He is an author of uh, many books. Um, in particular, he's extremely well known for his book on pseudospectra. I call him Mr. Pseudospectra from time to time. And he also was involved in organizing the $100, 100 digit exchange uh, in 2002. And he's an inventor of Chep Fun and not Chep Fu, as listed in the bios of the thing. Nick. The floor is yours. Walter, thank you very much. That's uh, very kind of you. Now, let me see. I will see about sharing the screen. Um, is it working? I don't think it is. Not yet. Hold on. Um, now it's coming. Now something is not yet there. Is that right? Okay, great. Okay. Uh, well, hello everybody. Uh, I've had a wonderful week and I'm so impressed with how well and smoothly this has gone. It's, I've enjoyed this conference a great deal. It's really been wonderful. So thank you Slovenians and others who made this happen. Uh, I wanna talk about rational functions. Here we are at the end of the week. Rational functions are a pretty hot subject in various parts of constructive mathematics these days, especially in areas related to uh, model order reduction and control theory. And indeed, Volker Mehrmann is very much in that area. And there was a wonderful mini symposium uh, yesterday and Monday, I guess it was, run by uh, Sander Lefteriu and Jan Victor Gosha about uh, that side of rational functions. My talk is going to emphasize the application of rational functions to solving PDEs, and in particular, the classical uh, elliptic PDEs in the plane. So uh, let me mention before starting that this is joint work with Stefano Costa in Piacenza in Italy, an electrical engineer. And this is a case where I have never met my co-author. He was about to visit Oxford uh, a year and a half ago, and then the pandemic arrived, and so we've been in touch electronically. We've never met. Isn't that strange? Uh, here is a picture of some people I've worked with over the years related to rational functions. This has been a topic of interest to me since I was a graduate student. In those days, maybe more theoretical, and nowadays, maybe more numerical. Indeed, a, a mission of mine has been to make approximation theory more applied. I don't think Volker mentioned my book on approximation theory, though I'm sure some of you know it. And that was largely written on a sabbatical visiting his group in Berlin. So anyway, here are some of the people I've worked with over the years. And you can see uh, the one who I haven't met on the upper left there, Stefano Costa. Now, this slide will show you the outline of the talk. And to understand the outline, we need to talk about three the three most important representations for rational functions in computation. First is the obvious one. A rational function is a ratio of two polynomials. That's the simplest way to prove things and to talk about mathematical properties often. Mathematically very simple. Numerically, it's not much good, however. And the trouble is that if you have a generic rational function, this works pretty well. But rational functions are most powerful when the poles are clustered. And in precisely that context, this 
representation falls apart. It becomes numerically exponentially unstable in a certain sense. So in the very cases you care about most, T over Q is no good. The perhaps most common representation used for computation, at least by people who are serious about this kind of thing, is related to partial fractions. And here I've written just R as a sum of simple poles. Of course, poles aren't always simple, but it's convenient to pretend they are much of the time. When you have a sum of simple poles, it's practically linear. Indeed, if you know where the poles are, it is linear. If you don't know where the poles are, it's not linear, but that sort of linear flavor to this representation gives it a lot of its power. Partial fractions are computationally simple, and if you're solving, say, the Laplace equation, it's a big advantage that you can very easily take the real part and work with that. And of course, you know where the poles are. They're the numbers z sub k. So if you have a region where you don't want poles, you can easily enough make sure none of the zk lie in that region. The trouble is, we don't really know where to put the poles to get good approximation. So if you're working in this setting, you very quickly find yourself addressing nonlinear optimization problems, which are not convex and have lots of difficulties. Now, partial fractions are the setting of lightning PDE solvers, which is what I'll talk about for a few minutes this hour. The third representation is the one that is outstanding numerically from a stability point of view. This is a so-called barycentric representation. And it's simply a quotient of two partial fractions. So it looks like partial fractions, but in fact, it's very, very different because with partial fractions, the z sub k's are the poles. With barycentric, the z sub k's are certainly not the poles. They're the so-called support points. And indeed, with the barycentric representation, you have a complete decoupling of the poles, which you can't see in that formula, and the so-called support points, which you can see. It's that decoupling that makes the method so powerful and numerically stable. On the other hand, if you can't see where the poles are, it's hard to uh, apply constraints to them. There's no easy way to force a barycentric representation to have no poles in a certain region. Now, it's this representation that led to the uh, AAA approximation method, which I will begin the talk talking about, which was actually a year earlier than the lightning PDE stuff. So the new content of this lecture is an outgrowth of these two ideas. As you'll see, combining AAA with lightning ideas, we get what we call AAA least squared. And that's the third part of the talk today. So here's my outline. First, talk about AAA, then talk about lightning, and then the new material, AAA least squared. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the barycentric uh, rational formulation where the poles are free to do what they want and that's a virtue from many points of view. So free poles and AAA approximation. And I wanna begin before even telling you what this is by doing a demo in MATLAB, which I do in most talks as I'm sure many of you know. So I'm talking to MATLAB here and I'm going to type in a few lines that you see there. So I'll see, I'll say Z equals Rand of 2000 comma one plus one I times Rand of 2000 comma one. So that gives me 2000 random points in a square. And now I'll plot those points and you see the square it's the unit square while going from zero to one, one. And you can see these random points in that square. Now I'm going to pick a function that I like, the square root of z times one minus z. And I'm evaluating that function at these 2000 points. So now I have a vector of points z and a vector of function values f. And we might want to do rational approximation of that data. So let's do it. I'll say tick. And I want to compute the rational approximate and its poles. So I'll say r comma pole equals triple a of f comma z. 
And I'll do that. And in fact, I'll immediately do it again because the first time you try something, you don't get a good timing. So we don't yet know what we've computed, but whatever it is, it was very rapid. We've found this rational approximation in a 16th of a second, more or less, on my laptop. If I say length of pole, you can see whatever it is, it has 21 poles. If I say norm of f minus r of z comma inf, you can see that whatever this approximation is, it's accurate to about 14 digits. So in a 16th of a second, we found a rational function whose maximum deviation from the data at those 2000 points is 10 to the minus 14. Uh, let's plot it. So I'll say, um, hold on and plot the poles as red dots. You see this beautiful effect in rational approximation, poles tend to approximate branch cuts. And uh, there's all sorts of fascinating mathematics there that I'm not going to go into. But uh, many, many interesting things, uh, much interesting mathematics underlies the power of rational functions for approximation. This function has singularities at the lower left and lower right corners. That's why the poles are clustering there. And that's why rational functions are so important. If you tried to approximate this with polynomials with uh, 21 degrees of freedom or 42 degrees of freedom, you might get a couple of digits, but you'd never get anywhere near six digits, let alone 14. It's interesting to do a phase portrait. It's that uh, alias Weigert who made these famous. If I do that, you can see a color coding in this bit of the complex plane for the argument of the rational function R. And there again, you can see that the uh, poles are approximating a branch cut. And um, of course, it's that single valued rational function. There's no real branch cut. And yet, clearly, there's an approximate discontinuity across that curve. I'm trusting you can all hear me. It's the usual mystery of giving a talk in this era. Okay, so now having shown you the AAA algorithm applied to one example, let me say a quick word about what it is. First of all, it stands for adaptive Antulas Anderson. It's descended from an algorithm of Antulas and Anderson. And indeed the mini symposium I mentioned was very much the Antulas school of uh, rational approximation. This algorithm originates in a paper uh, that we worked on in the fall of 2016 at Yudi Nakatsukasa, Olivier Set, and I, and the paper appeared two years later. And you can see the uh, dedication to Jean-Paul Beru, who's been very important influence on me. It works with the barycentric representation. And here's how the algorithm goes. First of all, in this barycentric form, we're always going to take the numerator coefficient to be the function values times the denominator coefficient. So that means it's going to automatically interpolate the data at whatever M support point Z sub K we've chosen. So the, it's a greedy algorithm. It chooses one support point after another. And every time it chooses another support point, the way it does that is among the 2000 samples you've got, it finds the one where the error is the largest. And that becomes the next support point where there will be automatic interpolation of the data. That sort of covers half the degrees of freedom, but what are the values of B sub K going to be? And that's decided by a linearized least squares problem. So you multiply through by the denominator, you get F times D minus N as the thing you try to minimize. And that's a linear least squares. That's where the speed comes from. <clears throat> We're dealing with matrices whose length might be 2,000, but the width is just 10 or 20. And what we're doing with those matrices is just one linear least square step. So that's why AAA is so fun. What it does typically is very quickly get you rational approximations that are within an order of magnitude or so of optimal. So if you want to approximate something to 10 digits, uh, you can probably do it with AAA with 30 poles, whereas the optimal one might do it with 26 poles or something like that. The support points, 
magically cluster exponentially near the singularities, just as they need to do to get good representation and numerical stability. And we were really startled as we discovered how reliable this was. It's kind of a mystery that it works as well as it does. Um, to our surprise, it really does seem to have emerged as the fastest flexible method, works on any domain you like, any big discrete set of points in a complex plane. So that's uh, the AAA algorithm. Just to say a word about that clustering at singularities, um, it all goes back in a theoretical sense to a paper by Donald Newman in 1964. He proved, it's just a four page paper or something, that if you approximate the absolute value function on the unit interval, you get root exponential convergence. This is for best rational approximations as a function of the degree. So e to the minus constant times the square root of the degree. And this is made possible because the roots, the poles and zeros are clustering exponentially near the singularity. Well, it turns out that root exponential effect is very general. It applies to all kinds of branch point singularities. Donald Newman and others didn't focus on that in those days, but now it's clear. So it's a practical basis of numerical method. There's a lot of literature on the theory of this kind of thing, and I've mentioned some names there. Though until the last couple of years, not so much numerical use. <clears throat> Here to illustrate, I've plotted the error in best approximations for three problems: uh, square root of z plus one on the unit uh, on the unit disk, x to the one over pi on the interval zero one, and x log x on the interval zero one. So each one has a singularity, and in each case, notice the x-axis is the square root of the degree we're getting these beautiful straight lines showing root exponential convergence. So that's a, a pretty much a universal property in approximation near branch point singularities. And the poles cluster exponentially near the singularities and we know a lot about that that I won't go into. You can see them there for these three examples. Uh, those pictures are as clean as they are because they're best approximations. If you did AAA, you'd get wiggly curves that would lie a little higher up, but it would be similar. And of course, much, much easier to compute. Uh, to get these data took some real virtuosity. So that's all I'm going to say about AAA, which is the adaptive sort of, uh, what, what's the buzz phrase now? People say um, data dependent. Uh, a rational approximation scheme, fast and flexible. Now, I've always in recent years been interested in using these rational functions to solve PDEs with corners. If you have the Laplace equation, even in a square, there will be singularities at the corners. So you need rational functions to approximate the solutions accurately. So the idea of this method is uh, building on the root exponential effect that comes from Newman. We'd like to use rational approximations. Their real parts are harmonic functions, so they satisfy the Laplace equation. The trouble is the AAA method works for analytic functions, not harmonic, and that gap is a big one. So a few years ago, I was discussing this with Kirill Sirk, uh, now at the University of Toronto, and his proposal was, well, if we know so much about how the poles cluster, why not just make them cluster that way? Turn the nonlinear approximation problem into a linear one, pick the poles a priori, using our knowledge of the, their more or less universal behavior near singularities, and thereby get a fast linear method for solving the Laplace equation. And um, I have basically spent the last three years working on that idea with the six people listed there. Uh, it took us a while to use the name Lightning Laplace Solver because it sounds too cute. But the fact is, it's so appropriate. So, of course, Lightning means fast, obviously. But what makes it appropriate is that the Lightning Laplace idea is to cluster uh, poles near singularities, exploiting the very same potential theory that makes lightning strike at singular points. If you have a building with a corner, lightning tends to strike there because of the singularity. And that's intimately related with the mathematics 
that makes poles clustering there effective for approximation. I'm not talking about potential theory in this talk, but it's everywhere in this subject. So here, for example, you see the shard in London being struck by lightning. And then below it, you have a picture of our Laplace solver solving a Laplace problem on a triangle. Now, the idea goes like this. We suppose we have a Laplace problem on a planar domain with corners. Almost inevitably, there will be singularities at the corners, and a lot is known about them theoretically. In order to solve it accurately, we're going to use rational functions that are good at approximating those singularities. So we're going to approximate our harmonic function u by the real part of a rational function, and we're going to fix the poles of that rational function exponentially clustered near the corners, using our knowledge that I haven't told you the details of about how that clustering works. So you see in the box there, we're going to construct rational functions which are in partial fraction form. And then they'll also have a polynomial term to handle as it were the smooth part of the problem. So we like to call that Newman plus Runge. Newman in 1964 is the rational idea. Uh, Runge in 1885 is the polynomial idea. You do a least squares problem to find the coefficients a sub j and the polynomial. You then have a rational approximation and you can uh, a posteriori measure how good it is from the maximum principle. And since you've got these coefficients, you've automatically got the harmonic conjugate. That's a very beautiful aspect of these methods. Uh, the whole thing is to construct coefficients. So you end up with an analytic function whose real part is your harmonic function. So if you like, you can call that the Hilbert transform or the Dirichlet to Neumann map. These are coming automatically when you use this method. It's a variant of the method of fundamental solutions, but with this exponential clustering as a key part of the variant. So here to show a picture, uh, this is work with Abhi Gopal, who's finishing at Oxford now and about to go to uh, ISIS, uh, sorry, the Odin Institute in Austin, Texas. Um, for the Helmholtz equation, it's not strictly a rational function, but it's Hankel functions that have a similar flavor, and you can do the same kind of computation. For the Stokes equations, which is uh, Navier Stokes at Reynolds number zero, this is joint work with um, Pablo Grubeck, who's currently a graduate student at Oxford. It's now the biharmonic equation, but that can be reduced to analytic functions by an idea going back to 1898 by Gustav. This is a pain in the neck to implement, I have to say, but it works. Once you've done the month of effort to figure out what's going on, it actually works very impressively. Here's another example of the lightning Stokes uh, problem. Um, so here we've got a triangular fluid cavity, Reynolds number zero, remember. On the left is a picture you can find in Van Dyck's album of fluid motion showing uh, an observed configuration like this. I think it's aluminum dust particles are the flow visualization particles. And on the right, we have our numerical calculation in uh, half a second of laptop time, computing the result to nine or 10 digits of accuracy. You can see these beautiful uh, counter rotating vortices. There's the main flow in the top and then a counter rotating flow and then another and then another. In theory, it's an infinite sequence of counter-rotating vortices called the Moffat vortices. And the numerical method very quickly spots three of them, which is more than you could see in an experiment. So th this is my second and other uh, numerical demo. Let me just show you this lightning stuff in action. So I go back to MATLAB. The only bit of software we've written of this kind is called Laplace, and you can find that at my website. If I it's in it's in MATLAB. If I type Laplace, I can give it a vector of corners of a polygon or various other inputs, arbitrary domains with piecewise analytic boundaries. If I put various things in quotes, I get some preloaded demos. So here, for example, is the Laplace equation on a uh, L-shaped domain. Let's do it again to check the timing. So what you see on the left is a plot of convergence as a function of the square root of the number of degrees of freedom. 
So there's that root exponential convergence. On the right, you see the solution and the lightning poles that have been clustered near the vertices. So notice in this case, it took about a sixth of a second and the resulting rational approximation can be evaluated in 17 microseconds per point, just incredibly fast. The error is really the global error all the way up to the corner singularity. And if you want, you can crank that up. Uh, 16 digits is usually problematic, but 10 digits is usually fine. So if I say that, for example, the time will change from 0.16 seconds to 0.7 seconds. Uh, but now we really have 10 digits. Look at that beautiful straight line on the square root of degrees of freedom plot. And you can play around in other ways. If I give it an integer, it makes a random polygon with that many sides. Again, the nice root exponential convergence. Uh, there are other built-in shapes. Here's an isospectral drum, for example. Again, computing the results all the way up to the corners with an a posteriori check that that's really true to, by default, six digits of accuracy. And uh, I don't have as nice software for the Helmholtz and Stokes cases, but just to illustrate, here's a picture of a Helmholtz problem with a wave number of 20. And that particular demo code, if you negate the wave number, it changes from a plane wave to a point source. So here, notice it's a bit slower because Hankel functions take forever to evaluate. But the same principle, we're again uh, doing a linear solve with pre-assigned poles. Uh, the Stokes demo is another built-in code. It just does one configuration flow over a step. So there you see in about a second, we've computed to, I think, seven or eight digits of accuracy, the flow over a step at Reynolds number zero. And notice we've also plotted one of the two Gorsa functions. Remember the biharmonic problem turns into analytic functions f and g, and I've plotted f, you can see the domain, and you can also see f in a larger region. Whenever you work with these methods, you're implicitly working with rational neuromorphic functions in larger domains. Okay, back to the PowerPoint, and I think that's it for the uh, MATLAB. So for the last bit of the talk, I'd like to show you the new algorithm, which as I say, stands for AAA least squares. Combining these two ideas. So once again, let's suppose we have a Laplace problem on a domain omega. We have boundary data H. I'm talking as if everything's a Dirichlet problem, but of course one can do Neumann, et cetera. The idea of AAA least squares is to do something strange. You approximate the real data. Uh, that's a mistake. That should say H minus R. You approximate the real data by a rational function on the boundary of your domain. Now, so we're computing a complex analytic function which takes real values on the boundary. That's an unusual thing to do, but that's what you're doing. So you do this complex analytic approximation of real data on the boundary of a domain. You then throw away the poles you don't like in the domain, and then you do least squares in the poles you do like outside the domain. Now I'm gonna say it again as three bullets. So first of all, you, you run AAA to get a rational approximation, and it will have poles both in and outside your domain. You throw away the ones in the domain, and then you solve a linear least squares problem using just the poles outside the domain. And this was uh, Stefano Costa's idea. It's uh, breathtakingly simple and unexpectedly successful. Notice that we're now using both of these representations. You'd never get the speed and accuracy of AAA without the barycentric context, but you'd never have this flexibility with poles without the partial fractions context. So it's really intriguing how it blends those two, I think. Now, I'm showing you a bit of code here just to show you how compactly the essential bit of this computation can be done. What we've got there, I don't tend to use pointers, I guess, 
Um, maybe you can see a laser pointer there. We compute the distance of the poles to the data points in order to normalize the columns of our matrix. We then have a low degree polynomial term, maybe degree 10 or 20, for as it were the smooth part of the problem. But the crucial Newman part is this Q, the partial fractions. And then because we're doing Laplace, we crucially have to separate the real and imaginary parts of our polynomial and of our poles. That gives us a big, tall, skinny matrix. And uh, we then solve least squares using backslash. We solve this real least squares problem and that gets some coefficients, which we instantly wrap up into complex coefficients. So in these four lines, it's, it's amazing how compactly you can do these things these days. Uh, in the four lines here, we've constructed the fitting matrix involving these poles that we've selected, taken its real part, done the least squares fit with MATLAB backslash, and then wrap things back up to get complex coefficients. That's our Hilbert transform, if you like, or the uh, Dirichlet to Neumann map. Um, the way I've written it doesn't use Vandermond with Arnoldi orthogonalization, but that's actually a better way to do things if n is bigger than 10 or 15. And also we have what we call the local AAA variant. Um, sometimes you can get away with not a global AAA fit, but local ones near each corner. Now I'm gonna rather quickly show you some examples. Here we have a smooth domain. And on the left, you can see we've fitted the data on the boundary. There are blue poles in the domain and red poles outside the domain. We throw away the blue poles. Then we do a linear least squares fit in the red poles to get our Laplace solution. And on the right here, the error is plot against angle relative to the origin. So you can see it's basically nine digit accuracy. Um, incidentally, Laplace problems are very close to conformal maps. So this gives us a fast general method for conformal mapping too. Here's an example on the L-shaped domain. So we do our global AAA fit and we get blue poles in the domain and red poles outside the domain. We throw away the blue ones, we do linear least squares. And here we get eight digit accuracy in most places, but in this particular run only six digits near the re-entrant corner. That took 12 seconds because the global AAA fit had 294 poles, which is bad. But if you get to local fits near each corner, you get the same accuracy in 0.7 seconds. So that's our local variant of AAA LS. Uh, here's an example with curved sides, a kind of an L-shaped region, but with bytes taken out of it. There's nothing special here. It's mathematically the same. This method doesn't really distinguish curved from straight sides. Uh, so in this case, we got six digit accuracy in half a second. Let's do a doubly connected domain. So you can see there, it's kind of a rectilinear annulus. Um, we have blue poles in the domain, red poles outside the domain. We throw away the blue poles, do our linear least squares, and in this case, get eight digit accuracy in 1.7 seconds. Now for this case, because it's multiply connected, you need a polynomial term in Z and also one in Z minus some point in the hole, uh, reciprocal. You also need a log term. And to learn about these log terms, there's a beautiful paper by Sheldon Axler in the Math Monthly in 1986. I very much recommend that paper for anyone doing computations at the interface of harmonic and analytic functions. Here's an example of a triply connected exterior domain. So the domain goes to infinity. It's analytic at infinity. There are three rectangular holes. So the poles we end up keeping are inside those three rectangular holes. Uh, there are 624 of them, and we get 10 digit accuracy in this case, at, at least at a sample point in the middle there in, in two seconds. So with three holes, you actually need uh, polynomials associated with all three. So reciprocals of three different uh, values, and you need three logarithm terms which have to be adjusted to make sure there's no log at infinity, but that's easy to do. 
Our next example is what I call a zigzag function. And this one is purely real. So nothing's in the plane anymore. It's just that function on the unit interval. Why would you want to approximate that by a rational function? You wouldn't, but it's just to show off that it can be done. So I want a global rational function that matches that to high accuracy all across the interval. I do it in local mode. That is to say, I do nine local AAA approximants near the nine corners. This gives me poles. And this second plot is in the complex plane. You can see the poles exponentially clustered near the singularities. Two of them are marked blue because they turned out to lie on the real interval. And of course, those have to be thrown away. But that's easy. And then you do your linear least squares fit to get the global approximate. And it comes out beautifully. Isn't that nice? The blue dots show the error. It's a rational function of degree 481. And it has this global uh, seven digit approximation to the zigzag function. By contrast, if you took the same number of degrees of freedom and approximated by a polynomial, you could get uh, about three digits of accuracy. That may look like half as many digits, but it's even worse than that. As you crank up the accuracy further, polynomials uh, only improve algebraically, whereas rationals improve root exponentially. So uh, I guess this on the right there, you see the summary of the number of poles and so on. And uh, this computation took 0.7 seconds. Um, as I mentioned, this is the Hilbert transform, if you like. Uh, so for example, let's think of the Hilbert transform on the real line. There's a principal value integral I haven't written down that defines that, but it also can be interpreted as finding the harmonic conjugate of a harmonic function in a half plane or the Dirichlet to Neumann map for that half plane. Whenever you have a rational approximation, these conjugates come automatically. So from that point of view, you can write a Hilbert transform code on the real axis like this. You see it's written as a MATLAB function HT for Hilbert transform. What it does, if you just gaze at this code for a moment, is to set up an exponentially spaced grid going from zero out towards infinity not particularly optimal, but it's a nice grid for general functions that in this case might have a singularity at the origin. It does triple A. It removes the poles in one half plane and keeps the poles in the other half plane. It then sets up this fitting matrix just as before, and it constructs the complex fitting coefficient vector just as before. So this is the actual code we use. It's not pseudocode, it's the real thing. Uh, using this, you get a successful Hilbert transform. Uh, you can do cool things with generating um, function handles in MATLAB, so using the reshape operator is something we, we can all do in our sleep in this uh, lightning AAA world. Um, that gives you a function handle that evaluates your analytic function F, whose real part is u and whose imaginary part is the Hilbert transform v. So indeed, v is the imaginary part of f. Uh, if I run that on just one example here, and it takes two seconds to produce this plot, um, the function is e to the minus absolute x. So it's got a singularity at the origin. And you can see that as we take more and more points in our uh, discretization, we get um, better and better accuracy uh, improving very rapidly. So with a 300 point discretization of the real axis, we're getting uh, nine or 10 digits of accuracy in the Hilbert transform. Uh, I'm gonna say a word on theory. There isn't that much theory, um, but the start is promising. To remind you, we're talking about a Laplace problem, which in its simplest form is a simply connected domain with real boundary data. And to remind you, the global variant of AAA LS finds a complex rational function that matches the data. Again, that F should be an H. Throws away the poles in the domain and then does least squares fitting involving the poles outside the domain. And here's what you can prove. This method really works if your domain is a disk or a half plane, including with whatever singularities you like. That's not a precise statement, see the paper for that. 
Now, if your domain is not a disk or half plane, the method does not work in principle. And indeed, we have elegant examples that show it can fail catastrophically. But it appears the examples are non-generic. You always have to make something surprisingly analytically extendable to get these examples. So it would seem that in some generic sense, the method probably does work, but I don't have a theorem or indeed even a precise conjecture on that yet. Now I want to wrap up with um, <coughs> two slides about perspective. <coughs> First of all, a comment about rational functions versus the main competitor for these problems with singularities, integral equations. If you, the standard technology for solving one of these problems would be an integral equation. And you can see some names there. There are many remarkable people have incredibly powerful methods in these areas. It's beautiful and powerful and fast and accurate. It's, it's a neat subject. When you do solve something with integral equations, your goal is to find a boundary distribution and to find it exactly or to high accuracy. You really need to know precisely the charge distribution on the boundary. To do that, you have to use quadrature cleverly, but these people can use quadrature cleverly. Then to evaluate your solution, you need to do further integrals by further clever quadrature. Here, by contrast, is a picture of what's going on whenever you use these rational function type methods. You're not doing anything on the boundary except solving a least squares problem. Your actual representation of the function has nothing to do with the boundary. It lives outside the domain. The poles are outside the domain. There's a polynomial term. So the boundary has no special status. You don't need any quadrature. Everything becomes, I believe, much simpler. And then to evaluate the solution, you're just plugging into a rational function. You're not doing quadrature. I, I love these pictures. Uh, notice in this case, there are very weak corner singularities at five corners, but the strong singularity at the re-entrant corner. And you can see that the black ink is accumulating there. That reflects the poles of the rational function accumulating there. The yellow stripes come from the polynomial term that's related to Jentsch's theorem. If you fit without a polynomial term, you don't get the stripes like that at all. So I believe that this kind of thinking beyond the boundary uh, is a pretty fruitful way of going, which hasn't had the attention it deserves. Indeed, it's had next to no attention. Um, I think that it will turn out to have a certain set of problems for which it is by a good margin, the best way to solve them. But I would never claim this is all problems, but um, there will be certain problems for which is, this is really the right thing to do. In 3D, we haven't tried anything yet, and there are all sorts of obvious challenges, but I, I imagine there will be a role in 3D also. And let me finish by saying more of a word about why I think these methods have a future. So let's ask, what is a function? What I call the 18th century view is that a function is basically analytic. Obviously, they knew that not all functions were analytic, but their basic concept was, something you can write down a formula for. I'm thinking Euler, that kind of person. Um, if you're thinking numerically, you can converge to these things with polynomials because they converge exponentially. The 20th century view goes to the other extreme. It, the 20th century mathematical setting that is the standard one is that every problem comes with questions of regularity. You could say that the default assumption, more or less, is that a function is likely to be continuous, but anything beyond that, any derivatives are regarded as a kind of a bonus. And it's really astonishing when you start looking for it, how much of modern analysis is focused on regularity. What do PDE people talk about? Regularity. That's, you know, is a, I won't estimate a fraction, but a shockingly large fraction of this discussion. Um, Numerical people also talk endlessly about regularity and in finite elements, the question is always exactly what subalus spaces are you dealing with? That comes with a sort of piecewise polynomial way of thinking and convergence rates are always limited by regularity. So I'd like to propose that for many problems actually, what's really, what really lands on your desk with applications tends to be functions that are analytic apart from certain points or lines or curves or whatever where they have singularities. So let's call this the applied mathematics view. 
It's the view that a function is analytic except for isolated singularity. Now, sometimes, as in the schwartz christoffel formula, you can nail the singularities exactly, and then you're back essentially in the polynomial case with exponential convergence. But the theme of today's talk has been that much more generally, when you're in a problem like this, you can use rational functions and get root exponential convergence. That seems to be an almost universal tool for problems with isolated singularity. We're actually working on another tool which cranks that up to what we call log lightning approximations, where root exponential becomes exponential or exponential minus log. But uh, that's too new to talk about yet. Uh, that's work, uh, there's one paper still not accepted for Sinem with Yuji Nikatsukasa, and then Peter Badu and I, he's at MIT, are working on that. And that's it. So thank you all very much. And thank you all for a great week. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too.